The Bay of STEM Global Competitiveness Conference and the CCDC presents Harnessing the Power of the Collective, the Importance of Diverse Teams to Solve Future Defense Challenges, a Professional Development Seminar, featuring Director Dr. Eric Moore, Director C5 ISR Center Pat O'Neill, Former Acting Assistant Secretary Acquisition, Logistics, and Technology Stephanie Easter, National Industrial Business Operations Manager, Adrian Somerville, and Director of the Vehicle Technology Directorate, Dr. Jared Riddick. The saying, two heads are better than one, applies to the future defense environment. Tomorrow's defense environment will be filled with converged challenges. From cyber warfare to undermining political systems, the armed services need to be prepared to create solutions to problems that have been unseen in the past. It is clear that any individual organization cannot solve these issues on their own. To combat future challenges, the defense community must take a new approach to problem solving and leverage individuals with new skill sets whom they may not have traditionally partnered with in the past. It takes more than just bringing different voices to the table. The individuals need to integrate as a team in order to fully leverage the power of the collective and solve these complex challenges. Join subject matter experts from the Army, Navy, and industry to discuss the challenges and rewards of effectively building diverse teams. Without further ado, the Bay of STEM Global Competitiveness Conference and the CCDC presents Harnessing the Power of the Collective, the Importance of Diverse Teams to Solve Future Defense Challenges, featuring Dr. Eric Moore, Pat O'Neill, Stephanie Easter, Adrian Somerville, and Dr. Jared Riddick. So good morning, everyone. How is everybody today? We are a small but mighty team in this room right now. <laughs> And that's all right, because we're competing against hip hop. So it's all good. So we'll have to jazz it up and give them a little hip hop while we're here too. So today's panel is harnessing the power of the collective, the importance of diverse teams to solve future defense challenges. So as everyone know, in this room knows, you know, we live in a world with a lot of complexity, a lot of technological development. Things, technology, threats are all coming together in very interesting ways now. So we need some really diverse, talented teams. So I'm Dr. Eric Moore, director of the U.S. Army Combat Capabilities Development Command Chemical Biological Center. And I'm representing the U.S. Army Combat Capabilities Development Command, which I will refer to for the rest of this session as CCDC, okay? Um, and so we have the mission to provide the research, engineering, and analytical expertise to deliver capabilities to enable the Army and the Department of Defense to deter when necessary and to decisively defeat any adversary, now as well as in the future. So the technical challenges that we face in the Army and the DOD are complicated. We're living in an ever-changing, complex environment. As Dr. I mean, as General uh, McChrystal has talked about in his book, Team of Teams, you know, this pace of complexity, of technological challenges that we're facing today require really new ways and novel ways for people and teams to work together. So as we provide American soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines with the tools and technologies to compete against and defeat our adversaries, we really have to think about new and novel ways. In many respects, we say that we're doing 20th century technological development in the 21st century. So we need to rapidly keep pace. So we're working hard to solve evolving challenges and problems that face our nation. And so in order to do this, we really want to talk about how we team. We have to reach talented scientists and engineers as well as other sorts of folks as well in our workforce to work together and partner with us as well as with academia, with industry, to develop uh, the new novel solutions that enable our warfighter. So in that respect, I'm very fortunate today to have um, a really talented group of, of, of seniors and, and, and folks who've led in our government. I'd like to start with um, Mr. Pat O'Neill. He's the director of the U.S. Army Combat Capabilities Development Command, um, the C-5 ISR Center, which is the command, control, computers, communication, cyber, intelligence, 
Surveillance and Reconnaissance Center. So we call it C5ISR. Um, Pat, just briefly, maybe you could highlight some of your career. Um, just speak a little blurb on yourself. Okay, yeah, sure. I'm happy to be here. I've uh, been in the uh, Army for a long time with some really good uh, developmental assignments, including one at, Andrew, one at Andrews Air Force Base. Uh, so what I do is just, Eric, just Dr. Moore just said, is to me, for the warfighter, uh, knowledge is power, and knowledge is gotten through information, so all the things, sensors, communications, radars, um, cyber, being offensive on cyber and defense on cyber, that's, that's what's important. Just a couple things quickly, um, not too much about my background, because um, you can all look that up, but you know, diversity helps in, in all the things you do. When you're into decision cycles, you have you have uh, tactical and objective and strategic things, and we need thinkers to think outside the box. Um, to really diverse teams are what helps me. I, I don't want to surround myself with people like me. I want to surround myself with people that are different. Um, I ran the Army Engineering Science Program for about four years when I was stationed at Redstone Arsenal. And one thing you took to learn about engineers and scientists is the whole STEM field. You, you can always have people that are that are extroverts and reach out, but for the most part, engineers and scientists want to be back in the lab doing their own thing. And as you as you reach across boundaries, there's diversity in many ways. Diversity in how you approach things and how you think, and uh, it's, it's really important. Um, and also, uh, you know, out, outreach is outreach is really important. So I like the name of the panel, Eric, harnessing the uh, power of the collective, because that's what it's all about. Diversity is critical. So. Pat definitely um, walks the talk. He's mentoring a lot of folks. He actually sends people to me sometimes uh, that he's mentoring as well, so I really appreciate that. Um, next, I'm very fortunate to have Ms. Stephanie Easter, who is the former Acting Assistant Secretary of the Army for Acquisition, Logistics, and Technology. She has a number of other experiences, too many to name here, so I'll just let you say a few things. I've also had the pleasure of serving on panels with her at uh, Women of Color and STEM and others, and she's just, she just immediately came to mind when I started putting this panel together. Thank you, Eric. Good morning, everybody. Morning. Okay. First, I'll say those of you who are in the back, you probably should move more. That way, we won't have to talk so loudly, you know. And plus, it's just this connectedness, diversity, harnessing the power of the collective. <laughs> so let's collect up front. Okay? This is what I'm talking about. <laughs> So uh, my name is Stephanie Easter. Um, I recently retired from the Department of the Navy uh, after serving as the director of the Navy staff. Um, for those of you in the Army, that is the equivalent of the, the DAS, a director of the Army staff. Um, my background is mostly in acquisition. As Dr. Moore stated, I served as the Army Acquisition Executive for two years, and I also served a lot of different acquisition positions within the Navy. Um, most recently, probably the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter Program if you haven't heard about it, you should Google it. It's the most amazing technology in the world. Um, but um, over my 35, 34 years of experience with DOD, I've had the opportunity to lead a lot of different complex and diverse organizations. And as um, Dr. Neil said, it's not just diversity of thought and gender and race, but I've dealt with all of it, right? And I think I look forward to the opportunity to talk about some of the experiences that I've um, had and a lot of things that I've learned about the benefit that comes with harnessing the power that everybody has to offer. And also hopefully touch a little bit on some of our biases that we deal with mm -hmm. when it comes to diversity and how we can overcome those. And I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Thank you, thank you. So I'm also very fortunate to have actually served on a panel before with Ms. Adrian Somerville. It was a mighty panel too, it was great. We had go-go music and all kind of stuff going on in that one. We could have competed with those uh, hip-hop nation over here, especially in DC with go-go. But at any rate, um, Ms. Adrian Somerville is the National Industrial Business Operations Director for the US Navy. Um, Adrian, could you? So good morning, everyone. Um, thank you very much for this amazing opportunity to serve with all these stellar leaders and um, to speak with you this morning. So I have the pleasure at um, Commander Fleet Readiness Center, Naval Air Systems Command, to be the business off officer. For the most part, my career has been focused on acquisition. I've purchased, I was the contracting officer for V-22s, for, which is also a great platform, mm -hmm. vertical lift, and um, F-18s <laughs> and H-60 helicopters on behalf of Naval Aviation. I've been successful at reinventing myself and moving over to program management 
but I think what gives me credibility here today um, is the ability to communicate having established the African American Pipelines Affinity Group to Naval Air Systems Command, very focused on um, ensuring we're removing barriers for women um, to ensure that they're able to reach some of the higher graded positions. So very excited about diversity and inclusion at Naval Air Systems Command. And um, I've supported a number of those um, affinity groups in support of that. So thank you for having me. Thanks, Adrian. We're also very fortunate to have Dr. Jared Riddick, who's the Director of the Vehicle Technologies Directorate at the U.S. Army at CCDC's Army Research Laboratory. Now, Jared always, as well as out there mentoring, he's doing great work. Everywhere I go, they've got, I go to Vanderbilt, they got photos of Jared up. And I said, didn't you, <laughs> didn't you go to Howard? Uh, he's always mentoring, he's, he's sending folks to me from, actually from London and all kinds of places. So I really appreciate all the high speed things that you're doing, but could you kind of just highlight? Thank you so much. Um, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, good morning. You know, um, I'm on a thank you tour right now. So I just want to start off by saying some thank yous. First, thanks to Bea for this event. I mean, this is really amazing to bring this many people together yearly at this, this type of event. Thank you to Dr. Moore for inviting me to come out. I really could spend most of my time today just heaping praise on uh, some of the folks who are on the panel. I won't do that. I'll do what I've been asked to do. <laughs> Um, so I, I don't know Adrian Somerville, I hope we have a chance to talk, but she used the word inclusion. And when we talk about diversity, the other side of that coin is inclusion. Diverse teams are very important, but access and inclusion really is, is sort of the, the action part of diversity. And I, and I look forward to talking about that today. So anyone who's paying attention to the Army right now knows that Army has recently stood up a new command, Army Futures Command. It's a four-star command. and. And we're going through in the Army right now the most drastic change to how we acquire uh, weapon systems for the future warfighter, the most drastic change in about four decades. And um, I often tell people that what we're going through right now is developing systems for the future. Somewhere in the future, there will be a man or woman in a battle against an enemy that the likes of which we can hardly imagine. And they will depend in that battle on technology that we're developing now. And I often tell my staff that that's not enough for us to think about getting it right, then we need to you know, get out of the business. Because getting it right now means that that uh, warfighter, man or woman, somewhere in the future will have the, the advantage over the, the, the adversary that they face and they can fight, win, and come home. So that's what I'm engaged in. Um, on the vehicle technology side, man, unmanned, air and ground vehicles, I look forward to having a great conversation today. And thanks for having me. Outstanding, let's get to it now. Now, before we do though, um, this is participative, right? You may not know that. So <laughs> as we start having conversation both ways, I have a couple of books. Uh, uh, one of my mentees for over 20 years, who's now a colonel down at AFC, has written a book, and he and I are going to write a book together on uh, the next project. But this one is called The Morning Mind, Use Your Brain to Master Your Day and Supercharge Your Life. So you might just win one of these three books. So uh, let's start with the first question to Mr. O'Neill. What does a diverse team's culture look like in terms of mindset, behaviors, attitude, et cetera, from your experience? And then once you kind of hit it, we can go down the line for other panel members. <clears throat> so the big thing to me is <clears throat> a diverse team, there's many different factors. Um, you need to take it, if the characteristics of a diverse team are going to ho hopefully lead to openness and embracing new ideas. So it's, it's diverse backgrounds, it's diverse personalities, it's diverse um, sexual, it's diverse racial, it's diverse thinkers, it's diverse knowledge. There's lots of stats that we have to keep in mind as we go forward, like in the, in the active duty army right now, 42% of every active duty military, 42% are non-white. 16% um, are female. You know, those numbers, of course, are changing over time. We need to keep that in mind as we go forward. Um, also, the whole U.S. population with the majority minority switch is going to happen in about uh, 15 years. Just keep that in mind as we go forward. So, so to me, when, when you're tackling a problem and how you form a team, the number one principle to me is diverse thinking, diverse background. Let me give you just a couple, a couple of examples. Um, I'm reorganizing my center for the first time since it stood up in, in 1981. Um, and it's important to do this right because, as, as Jared mentioned, Army Futures Command just stood up. The first time since 1973, the Army has changed the ACOM, the Army Command. It was done for very specific reasons, so we need to get it done right. So as part of that, 
I have to reorganize my center because of many reasons. One, I lost one of my SDS class. But more importantly, we just haven't been doing things right. We've been a little bit too uh, um, uh, competing fiefdoms, is how it got described to me by the general officer that, that uh, gave me this guidance. So we put together a team to, uh, to tackle this, um, how to do this uh, reorganization. And so I asked to look at the list, right? And uh, when I looked at the list, it was a little, everything I'm saying here is close hole, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Non-attribution. This is a safe space. Non-attribution. <laughs> Unless they right? record it. <laughs> so, uh, it would be a broadcast throughout the hotel. <laughs> it's streaming. It wasn't, it wasn't diverse enough. It is streaming. For many, you can screen this for me, right? It wasn't, it wasn't diverse enough from many points of view. Um, and and I, I looked and made sure I have six different directors. Some of them weren't represented enough. That's part of diversity. Um, there, was a, there was a bunch of co-chairs named. The initial one, there was no female co-chair. There was no non-white co-chair. So I reached down and made this happen. I named a couple people that are going to be on this team. And... Um, People take it the right way. I try to take it a high level. I don't want the following people added to the to the group. Um, the other thing is is the thinking. It, it, it's you know, race is important, sex is important, thinking is important, also background is important. But I also said, go find. I have eight different tiger teams, right? I said, go find sixteen people that have been here less than three years, mm -hmm. but two of them on each team, mm -hmm. just so there's new thinking in here. Mm -hmm. Talk to each of them about this whole. I'm not. I'm not obsessed with introvert extrovert. But if you've ever taken the Myers Briggs um, type indicator, it's um, it's really it's really important. You know, I mean, we don't want this Tiger team sitting there with 30 people just sitting there and not thinking and not listening to one person talk and not having their ideas come out. So, as I put together these groups, I really I really took a look at that to be to be balanced. Um, I think uh, as we go through this, I won't say too much more, Eric, but uh, anytime we're taking a tackling, tackling a challenge like that, don't get a bunch of people that just think alike. I said that a couple of times about myself. I don't want people around me that just think like me. You know, and I learned that the hard way growing, growing up in, in the Army here, and you really want diverse mindsets, and, and, uh, and like uh, Ms. Issa said, that, that diversity can mean a lot of different things. I appreciate that. Any other panel members want to chime in on that one? I'll just add, a, I agree with everything he said. He covered a lot of it. The culture, you know, openness, inner, engaging, patient, and inclusive to um, Dr. Reddit's point. Um, and I've had similar experiences. Dr. Neil, you know, you get a team together. But everybody in here, is everybody in here a DOD employee? Okay. Don't know. But okay. NIH? Okay. But a government employee. Okay, great. So nine out of 10, you all function in teams, right? Everything we do is done in a team for the most part, unless you're fortunate enough that you don't have to deal with anybody else. <laughs> and I want your job, so please see me right after. <laughs> um, but my point is, when we're in teams, we have to be able to function as a team. And to just make some um, additional points on that, if you're in a team and you have engineers, you have logisticians, you have contracting officers, you have financial managers, it's very easy, especially in technical organizations, to believe that engineering is king. That's what I believe, because I'm an engineer, right? So what else does anybody else have to offer? Neuroscience. <laughs> you know? Neuros neuroscience. And science. <laughs> science okay. But the technical, we have a tendency to do that. But when we're in our teams, we have to make sure we engage everyone. Okay, Just because I'm not the technical expert does not mean that I don't have something to offer. And that takes action on the half of everybody in the room. So we talk about diversity and inclusion. It's about action. It's not about how we look. It's about how we act. Mm -hmm. Okay? Because it's not sufficient to have all the different people represented and have a minority female as the co-chair, but no one listens to what she says. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Or to dismiss the ex the you know, the introvert because he or she, you know, did not have enough, you know, courage at the time mm -hmm. to say something. So you have to draw that out of them. It's about action. Okay, so that's how I just want you. It's about action. Diversity and inclusion requires action. It's not how we look. It's how we perform and how we respond. And I'm off my soapbox. <laughs>
So I would offer to the extent in which you're not diverse, we're weak. And so it is about inclusion and it's about getting to know individuals on more of a personal in addition to a professional level so that there is not a sense of um, being a fact or a figure, but we recognize the feelings and the faces associated with the products that we're trying to produce. Um, when I think of a, an environment that promotes diversity and inclusion, there are several words that come to mind, and some have already touched on that. But the transparency and vulnerability is key when we're trying to generate innovation and creativity and draw that out of all the key players in the, on the team. And if we view this as a, a team sport, there's always communication and there's learning and there's appreciation for the diversity of thought that everyone brings and the brilliant ideas that are all, always kind of inside that flourish and come out. So I think it's being it's having an environment where we can be expressive and be our authentic self. Um, all of that brings character and richness when we think of teaming and um, products for our fleets, our warfighters, our sailors, our Marines, and our troops on the ground. You know, I'm willing, I, I concur with what's been said, so I'm willing to let, let us move on to the next question. I, okay. I'm not going to be the guy that has to speak on every question. I got you. <laughs> I got you, big guy. I, I appreciate that. I won't be that guy. I appreciate that. Yeah. I appreciate that. That's why you're on the panel, too. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to get invited to another one. So, <laughs> so we've kind of touched on this, but we could possibly dig a little deeper into it. So we talked about bringing different people together. We talked about diversity, but we also talked about inclusion. And so how can we create that environment where all team members feel comfortable valued and are able to contribute. So let's let's dig a little deeper into that. Yeah, so um, I want to use an example um, to speak to that. And um, so I have a colleague who uh, served a long time in, in the Army, and he's, uh, I'm sorry, Army Research Lab, retired. He's looking at what's going on, and he said to me um, one day that a lot of these old companies that have been around for a long time are now realizing that they can't continue to sell the same old products to the same old people the same old way. And in industry, they probably realized that quite some time ago and rapidly have begun, begun to change. So you see this explosion of innovation. And so now, as uh, um, the Army in acquiring things, we're really sort of uh, uh, taking on uh, how do we engage this explosion of innovation that's going on new companies and new teams within companies are being formed to sell new products to new people in new ways. And so the impact that that has, you know, when we look at uh, the, the traditional folks that we've engaged with in the Army to, uh, to procure new technology, you know, we have to look at it in, in a new way. Um, there's this notion that non-traditionals, folks that we have not engaged with before, um, startup companies and all these other uh, technology companies are getting way ahead and we don't have a really good way to engage with them from within the Army. Uh, so this, this, uh, this need to team with non-traditionals uh, sort of has driven within me uh, thinking about how do we engage with a startup company that is not big enough to sort of keep their lights on but we're asking them to you know come and, and partner with us and and do things that a much larger company that has a much larger team is able to do um, and, and very easily and effectively. And so uh, what we've done uh, in teaming with some of these organizations is sort of looked at if we have a common interest in a technology um, and you really see a product path in your you know, company's future for that technology, even if you're a really, really small non-traditional company, and I, I have an interest in a technology. Now we have a common interest, right? You're going to do development uh, as a small business. Um, I have common interest in that. I, I need it for a future technology. So with that common interest in mind, even though we haven't normally worked together, we have a reason to work together. And that objective drives the desire of, of, of us to be together in a team. So common objectives, even when the, the, the team members that are getting, getting together are completely non-traditional, never have really worked together, are, are something that can really, really drive you to be together. And once you have that common objective, you have to remain focused on that because you're non-traditional. You haven't worked together before. It can be very hard for you to be together. There are a lot of distractions, but if you stay focused on the objective, then that really helps the, the team of truly non-diverse members uh, work together toward, toward a common objective. Yeah, just a couple of thoughts. You know, I talked 
briefly about the characteristics that make up a diverse team, you know, whether it's, you know, background, like if we have a team put together, whether it's in my organization or across CCDC, it's not easy to take a look. Are there some, we're in a command where there's hardly any active duty military. So when we're building a team, we always try to find at least a couple of retired soldiers that can join that team and give that perspective. That, that's one thing. I talked about the engineer introvert thing. We, we write diversity of knowledge. We don't want 10 different electrical engineers tackling the problem if we have to be thinking about um, the analysis piece of it or how it's going to connect to a real piece of equipment. Um, also, you know, Jared talked about, and I, and I follow up briefly on Army Futures Command, the first change since 1973. One of the things they've really done, and we've learned, we've been in, Eric and Jared and I have been in it for about a year now, is uh, more and more push out to industry. Have a real team of industry, academia, and in-house government. And I know uh, most of us do things the same way, and I talked to Christensen from Aviation Missile. Only 50% of, of my funds stay in-house. The rest is bringing in industry. And we do things like that. We're also reaching out more and more to academia. Um, you've heard the phrase small business innovative, innovative research cibers. We have about 80 of those in, in my center. And two of them are with brand new startups that, that I'm not sure if Adrian or you, you mentioned startups. Um, but it's really important. Also, the Army's doing it differently with this thing called the cross-functional team setup. Or their team now with with the PEOs to try to try to make things better. So it's it's more of the thinking outside the box, um, which is what we're. And, and Eric, you gave me a, a phrase the other day: two heads are better than one. <laughs> <laughs> Amen on that. And uh, also, I really love football. And one of the, my favorite teams is in. There is no I in team, so that needs to be kept in mind. Also. And I forgot to say thank you for inviting me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I see. I see. It's I, I, no, I appreciate you. So I want to make it more interactive. Audience members, at any time you can ask questions, but I see a question right there. Uh, one of them, I really enjoy vignettes uh, and hearing about how you overcome things with your vast experience you've had. So I was hoping each panel member could share one barrier they've encountered to diversity and an action going off what Ms. Caesar said of how you overcame that barrier. So b before you start, come up here and get one of these books, because you just took over my job. I appreciate that. <laughs> I appreciate that. I'll stand it. All right. All right. So I'll, I'll take the first shot at that because I was going to kind of piggyback on the last question anyway to kind of make it a little bit more personal because um, Dr. Reddick made a good point about non traditionals and the team and aspect from a technology perspective, but the same thing applies to us as humans. Mm -hmm. Okay. Non traditional is in the eye of the beholder. Mm -hmm. So for me, traditional is. African American female from North Carolina, because that's where I grew up and that's how I, you know, that works for me. That's me. That's how I roll, right? <laughs> so non tradi but non traditional could be very different for Patrick O'Neill. So my the point I want to make, I'll share one of my biases, okay, and how I overcame it, because connection is important. And the point that he made about focusing on the common objective is is key. And biases is what forces us. Uh, to have issues with diversity. So I'll, I'll share a story, of, and I won't, since this is being streamed, I'll keep it personal and not work-related. But I've, I've experienced this in the workplace as well, just being an African-American female. I mean, people see me, and they see that first. So we are all creatures of our experiences, and we all have them. So I grew up in North Carolina, as I shared, and um, I grew up in an environment where if you had tattoos, then you rode a Harley motorcycle and you were a bad person, okay? Not someone I would want to hang around. That was just the environment I grew up in. And if you have tattoos, don't take this personally, okay? I'm, I'm over this bias now. <laughs> so that was my thing. So I find myself working around people who have tattoos, and all of a sudden, I start to question their contribution. Okay, and I'm just keeping it real here. This is real, right? And so I've, me, Miss Everybody Equal, you know, found these little, you know, words in my head like, oh, he has a tattoo. <laughs> you know, what does that say about him? <laughs> and then it hit me, right? My, at the time, 17-year-old goes off to college, <laughs> and he comes home, <laughs> and what does he have? 
tattoo. Oh no, a sleeve. Okay. Oh. Oh. So it forced me to face that bias. So now I'm in a situation where I have to reconcile in my head: is everything that I perceived about people with tattoos true? And my son is one of them, a bad person who I gave birth to and raised. Okay, <laughs> or perhaps my thoughts about tattoos weren't valid. Mm -hmm. And that's what dealing with is about. Okay, so I had to come to grips with that. And I came to the conclusion that my thoughts about tattoos weren't valid because I knew my son. I knew how he was raised. I know I gave birth to him. So it goes back to that's why that relationship and getting to know people is so important. So that forced me to go to the engineer that I was working with that I by the way, I hadn't seen the tattoo until like a weekend because he wore suits every day. And we got called in for a weekend event, a testing event, and he had on a polo and I saw the tattoo. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I thought he was a great engineer. You know? And I'm just keeping it real, right? And I had to go back and apologize to him. Okay? And so that's that's how I dealt with it. But it took, and I hope it doesn't take you guys, this is for you to learn from what I've done, don't repeat it. But don't get to the point where someone personal and up close to you has to prove you wrong. Mm. Just question yourself and mm. get to know the individuals that you're dealing with the bias against and you'll re recognize that you have more in common than you don't and that most of the things that we perceive about people aren't true. Okay, and so that, that's my story of dealing with challenges with diversity from a non-traditional perspective, but just to help make the point. I'd kind of like to, to, to harp on that just a little bit. I have some of the same biases that you have. <laughs> I'm over mine now, so you need to get out. Historically, historically. Okay. So, so I was at a, at a, a picnic at one of uh, the defense agencies I used to work at, and a young lady who was hardworking, really good people and everything, we had we were in shorts and whatnot, playing volleyball and all this stuff, and she had like uh, tattoos in the back right here. And so some of the folks said, I thought she was squared away, but she's got a tramp stamp. And I said, oh. I said but, but, but you know her work. She's still doing good work, so does it matter? Exactly. Right, right, right. Exactly. Hey. So I think someone else had their hand up um, to, for a question or something, I think. Oh, Dr. Bacon, okay. How you doing? I'm sorry, I'm short. Uh, I'm not sorry I'm short. Short people will take over the world. Yes. <laughs> but we will be kind to the tall. Uh, Dr. O'Neill, I, I have a question for you. Um, I noticed that you said when you're reaching out, you reach out to the retired military mm. to bring in the military um, retired from uh, perspective. But as the young today are really, really making um, their attitude is so totally different from that that say a more uh, senior or, and retired person may have. Um, is there a way that you're also including that younger perspective? And I know it's very difficult because when you're, you're talking infantry or you're talking uh, fl uh, flight personnel, uh, however, that it's difficult to reach to, to decide which one. Uh, but is there a way to include, or, and, and you may be, because you said something about cross-functional teaming, so there may be a way you're doing, but if you could just uh, elaborate on how you're Absolutely. doing Absolutely. So look, it's a great idea, and I, you know, I'm always thinking about baseball stats. We're not batting a 1,000 doing that. You know, so we're in a command where I have 2,000 civilians and I have 26 military. Think about that. So one active duty soldier for every 100 engineers, mm -hmm. but that's tough. Um, so I'm, I'm doing the best I can. It, it, it would be easier if I had you know, more firepower. You're listening to Harnessing the Power of the Collective, the importance of diverse teams to solve future defense challenges, a professional development seminar, featuring Dr. Eric Moore, Pat O'Neill, Stephanie Easter, Adrian Somerville, and Dr. Jared Riddick. Brought to you by the CCDC and the Global Catalyst for Change, the Bay of STEM Global Competitiveness Conference, where we make the untapped potential possible. Be sure to check out our social media pages on Facebook, 
Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Um, I'm trying to do things like uh, um, each of my six directors, when they push a product up, each of those six directors has at least one of the 26 military. And I said, whenever you have a review before it comes up to me, I expect you to have that military sitting and listening because they may have a perspective. And some of them are younger, um, you know, um, some enlisted. Um, we have a couple also that have come to my organization from different places in the Army for experience. So we're trying to do more on utilization of the military. Um, we're, not, we're not doing great. I also, one of the eight Tiger teams I talked about for reorganization, I, I made them, they had seven teams. I said, you're adding an eighth team, use of the military just to look at how we can do that. Now, frankly, we're not doing it great at it. Um, I wish we had more military. Um, and I've also found, by the way, that the six directors were not following my suggestion uh, <laughs> involving the military, because I get, got some back channel stuff. I said, how many of these reviews have you been in? What's a review? <laughs> <laughs> so I need to work harder at that. So but those are the kind of things we're trying to do. Diversity is very um, deliberate. So I'll give you an example to go back to the gentleman's question. So in my role, I work with a number of professional technical engineers, um, logisticians, program managers, and then um, the products that we produce and deliver enable the artisan community, more of the mechanics and sheet metalists. So you hear terms like white collar and blue collar, um, which has a negative connotation if I'm a so-called blue collar person. And so oftentimes the artisans, which I think artisans is nicer because it sounds so creative, and if you can disassemble an aircraft and put it back together, more power to you. That's a skill that I don't have. Um, so very creative individuals. But oftentimes the professional, considered more professional white collar individuals would design tools and products that the others have to live in that environment and use and apply with no input from the user group. Um, so for me, I started as we move forward in the sustainment model, reaching out and as we, we are identifying solutions for sustainment of naval aviation, it's pulling those individuals who have a lot to offer and we find we're more common than we are different once we have that dialogue and that opportunity. So for me, it's about being deliberate and including, and they're just so jazzed to be able to have some input into the design of a production system that they're going to have to live with, a routing system, um, and their voices do matter. So for me, it's about being very conscientious and deliberate. And when I look at the composition of the team, particularly those that will have to use those products, and you want to ensure that they're in the design and deployment phase. So, so now we have two questions on the essentially, so I'm going to hit both. Just warning you in advance. I'm going to start <laughs> with good. So on the bias question, you know, I often remind myself that all of the good ideas were not granted to African-American men who wear bow ties, glasses, and are bald-headed. <laughs> and I say that jokingly, um, but it's really important. I mean, some of the comments here really, really touch on it. You know, what uh, is required, you know, to actively engage from a leadership perspective in creating diversity. But I want to talk about it from a slightly different perspective because you did ask us about you know, challenges that we face. Um, and I said a, a moment ago that you know a colleague told me about the current environment that uh, new companies are emerging and realizing they need to have new ways to sell new products to new people. So this whole newness thing is now a commodity, right? And so as we think about diversity, you know, those of us who are, are diverse may find ourselves in positions where we are in teams where we are the non-traditional, as, as Ms. Easter referred to. And in those situations, it's really important that we, you know, we grant ourselves some permissions, right? You're new in the room, but your newness is the commodity, not a weakness. Um, the room is searching for new ways to sell new things to new people. Your voice is the new voice. You're that commodity, and I have to often remind myself because I find myself often, even here, what am I doing up here, right? But I, you're here in the situation because you, you have a voice and insight to offer, and you have to grant yourself permission to offer that insight. Um, 
I often tell young people that, you know, um, someone, you know, I, I'm from the South, I'm from a church tradition, and we often say, you know, somebody pray for me, right? Mm -hmm. When you sit down at that table, all of the communities and institutions and forebearers, we say, uh, who came before you are now, now have a seat at the table because you're there. Mm -hmm. So you have to grant yourself permission to actively engage to make the inclusion happen. Um, to Mr. O'Neill's point and the, the point about uh, military engagement, engagement from the music community. So with AFC being stood up uh, more than ever before in my career, I see uh, the user community, uh, even senior military leadership engaging with scientists directly in a way that I've never seen before. Now, at the beginning of doing that, it was really difficult because if you can imagine, um, you know, PhD scientists, we, we really have a lot of uh, self-importance. We really think we're really, really smart and that we know more than everyone else. And that would include, you know, no matter how many stars you have on your shoulder, right? Where I'm, I'm really, really smart. And so that engagement at the beginning, I think, was difficult. But I think it is incumbent on the scientists to realize that in order for you to be heard, you have to speak the language of the person that you're trying to reach, right? The engagement, really, from, from the perspective of the scientist, I'm there to inform, uh, if possible, influence and shape. And that won't happen if I don't translate it in a way that, that the, uh, the, the audience can receive it. And so one of the best things that's happened in, uh, in AFC is the, the, the placement of the CCDC, which all of the scientists and researchers into a command right alongside the future concept center. And so now we're tying science and the outcomes from science to the concepts, the concept development and concept exploration in a very systematic process. So at the beginning of exploring operational concept, we'll now have scientists and user community together, right? And so that validates really um, why we're investing in certain scientific areas, that validates for the scientists, how is your science going to deliver capability for the warfighter, and where does it fit into the operational picture? This is language that two years ago I did not use, right? And so this is one of the great things that I think has happened in AFC, and so the user and the scientific community are getting closer, and we're systematically building ways to do that. That is awesome. So I know we also have some Navy. You know, there's, despite the fact that we build diverse teams, so one of the reasons I wanted to reach out to you ladies is because in some cases, I think the Navy has somewhat outpaced the Army in some of the talent management. I mean, I'm, I know we all have our own challenges and stovepipes, but uh, I think you all have done some exceptional work in that domain, but just kind of the Navy perspective that you have. And Ms. Easter, you in particular have both mm -hmm. Army and Navy, yeah. um, but maybe Adrian mm -hmm. might kick it off. So um, I think the establishment and recognition of infinity teams is a win across. Um, and I'll share a personal story. Um, you're always conflicted with some of these teams, right? Just being honest and transparent. So if you're asked to serve on a team, you're wondering about your image, right? It's not like a black club or... So I even had to call Miss Easter one time <laughs> to just, um, in addition to doing some research, but just to confirm, right, because it is a little bit about your image and branding. Um, but I think the establishment and recognition for the needs of these teams, giving them direct access to senior naval um, officials, military officers, flag officers, and also senior executives to discuss the plights, to provide the data, to have that platform to propose solutions that we can act upon. You know, are we where we should be? Not, not there yet, but I would offer that we're making progress by even having the conversation. I think the success is that we can now talk freely about the metrics and about the, the lack of um, representation in certain areas and be very conscientious when we are out trying to deliver. Um, there's always a healthy balance, right? Because you're not trying to meet a quota. You're just trying to, and that's that. Some people really default to that, like, oh, we, you know, we don't have quotas, but we can have targets. And I'll just share a, a personal story. So my daughter interned um, at Accenture last year, and the first text was, um, and she was in Atlanta, uh, and the first text was the diversity, 
the number of women and their goal of 50% of their employees will be women in these leadership positions. Mm -hmm. And whether whatever your gender, sexuality, whatever, they all were representative. But she said they all seemed like everybody was the same. Like you really didn't see the differences um, because everybody was like the same. And so I thought I, I'd like for us to get to that phase where I can look across and regardless, we're still the same. Our mission's the same, our, our approach, and our commitment is the same so that those differences aren't really visible, but we still have some work to do. And I, I've had the opportunity, um, the fortunate opportunity to work both for the Army and the Navy. And I will say that the Navy definitely started out ahead of the Army, but I think the Army is doing an excellent job of catching up from a lot of different perspectives. So there's teams in the way we function. Um, I grew up at Naval Air Systems Command and we went to a competency aligned organization, integrated product teams was the only way I knew how to do business, right? So that meant as a function, you had all your functionals together. I saw the same thing happening in the Army, except for structurally in the Army, they were separate. Where I think in the Navy, um, when I was growing up in there, we had a big effort for an alignment activity across the Navy. And it started because we had a lot of different organizations all under the Navy or Navy or umbrella, but they all identified as individuals. Mm -hmm. And at the time, it was um, Admiral Dyer who said, we're going to align. And it was very, his visual was, he drew a circle mm -hmm. and he had arrows pointing out in every direction. And he goes, this is us. We're great. We are a great naval aviation organization, but everybody's doing their own thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, and this is about the power of the collective. Mm -hmm. And he redrew that. And he goes, I want everybody to do their own thing, but I want us all going in the same direction. Mm -hmm. So he drew the circle again, and every arrow was just going out to the side. Mm -hmm. The power of alignment. Mm -hmm. And the same thing applies in diversity. So I learned that very early. So when I came to the Army in ASOD and I saw the research, you know, science, things weren't as connected. Like contracting wasn't as close to, you know, the rest of acquisition. And, the engineers were here and the scientists were here. That was a little bit different for me, um, but I shared what I learned and I, I think that um, progress is being made. And I, I think some of that is coming through Futures Command and I think there'll be some benefit to that for, for years to come. But I thought, it made me think of Admiral Dyer's alignment analogy and it definitely applies to diversity because the whole point was you don't lose who you are. You know, you can be a great, like. Point Magoo, I mean, they're known for a mi missile range in the desert. They will always be an outstanding missile range in the desert. But what they're trying to accomplish needs to be the same thing that the people down at Cherry Point are trying to accomplish, even though they're in North Carolina. So it's that alignment, and I think it applies very much to our team and environments as well that we operate in. We all bring our individual unique perspectives, but if we're all going for the common goal, we'll be a lot more. Thank you, thank you very much. So, yes. How are you doing? My name is James Finney. Um, I had a question going back to what you said earlier. How do you get younger people to get engaged and to use their voice, as well as can you guys give me an example when you guys were maybe younger in your career and uh, some diversity you were able to effectively do? Thank you. So, um, I lead a really interesting organization. Um, we are a, a smaller directorate in a huge, in a, in a huge lab, and um, so we're really flat. I know all of the researchers in my directorate because I grew up there. So I have a really unique opportunity as a leader. I mean, I can seriously take my entire um, like 125 person staff and put them in a room and know every single person. So most leaders don't have that. And so I take advantage of that in some, some pretty unique ways. The other thing that's unique about my organization is that about 50% are around 30 and have less than 10 years of federal service. Um, in fact, when I first started, it was about 50% were under 30 and had less than five years of federal service. So I had this idea. I said, well, I want, I want to talk to the millennials. And um, I had a, yeah. a technical assistant at the time who was a millennial. So I tasked him with putting together a millennial mashup, we'll call it. And we're going to get in there and we're going to, you know, 
because we're small and we can have startup energy. And I had fashioned the whole meeting around the idea that we were like a startup <laughs> and I want startup ideas. And I went in there, I was really excited. And halfway through the meeting, one person raised his hand and said, has anyone in here ever been in a startup? <laughs> no. Jared, have you been in a startup? No, right? So the, the audience was so sophisticated, much more sophisticated than I was. And so that's the, well, I was expecting all these, you know, big dream ideas. So what, what do you want to do? And, and some person said, I just want to be able to order stuff and get it without having to wait six months to get it. <laughs> you know, I just want to be, and that was something that, you know, for them, they just thought that was all they wanted. And um, I was able to deliver that. But I went into that meeting thinking, you know, we hear all these things about young people. And I'm thinking, but it's just the basic things that they want and to have a voice, right? Just to have a voice. And I'm in a very unique position where my organization is so flat. Everyone calls me Jared. And so they have a voice. Um, and, and we really work on, on, on making that happen. Um, so. So in many agencies across our nation, and not just uh, you know uh, civilian agencies, but in government agencies, the higher you go up the, the chain of command, it kind of gets maler and paler, right? So uh, we have affinity groups, we have the you know the Asian American group, we have the African American groups, we have you know different affinity groups that you know try to you know take metrics, try to do studies and things like that, and 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 they go over the studies every year. They state the numbers, but then when you look at all the leadership, nothing changes. So my question is, even though we're running the metrics, even though we're stating the numbers, but when you look at leadership, it still looks the same. What, 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 what would you recommend to do from someone who sits in an affinity group and runs the numbers and has an African-American dinner once in a while? Um, what would you say to them to say, this is what you need to do to start making changes at the upper level. Because I can guarantee you, if you go into a room in any organization and you see all black male leadership, you would say, okay, something's wrong with this company here, <laughs> right? If you go into Walt Disney or if you go into um, you know, any large organization and you see, okay, there's nothing but uh, Asian American males that are at the leadership, but here we are in America, you would say, okay, something is wrong. However, when, when we look and see you know, Caucasian males running everything, always in leadership, you know, when they decide to pick someone to, to come and join the club, it's someone that looks like them, it's someone that acts like them. What would you say to the, the, the people in the lower levels that are, that are not fitting into that club that would like to provide some type of representation at the higher levels? So, so you, you remind me of some things in the past that are not pretty. I was named the EEO coordinator for my agency back in the mid-90s when I was like 15 years old. <laughs> I was kind of sort of a newbie. But, um, and I ran it for four years, and I was astounded at the stats. Not, they were not good, and they were not changing. Um, and and I, I'm not all about telling you ugly stories, right? But, but uh, I looked around, and I remember the, the old days we had GS-15s. Maybe some people still have GS-15s. Now we're on special pay pools. Right? So there were 26 GS-15s in your organization. 25 were white males. One was a white female. And then I found out some other things about some promotions that were going on that were just very troubling. Uh, it, it's actually very bad, some of the things. Like women would get promoted, promoted into a position, but not get their grade. Can you believe that? I mean, I can't believe that was happening. So your challenge today is what are, what are we doing today? I, so when I took over my place, I, I sensed a little bit of um, not really knowing how it was done. So I said, I put out an order after I was there several months. I said, every promotion panel or selection is going to have a female on it and it's going to have a minority on the interview panel. And if, if not, then the panel is going to reconvene and do it over again. And that doesn't mean people are doing things wrong. I mean, there can be great people doing interviews the great way. But I just want to try to enforce need to consider this as you go forward. Michael, that doesn't answer your challenge or question. There's things we can all be doing to, to keep making it to keep making it better. Mentorship, for example, we need to make sure we're mentoring 
in the right ways, ensuring that people have access to mentors, <coughs> whether they're introverted or not. Those are the kind of things that you say. And I said I was going to try to be the first one to answer every question, but this one I just got to step into. <laughs> okay, so um, you had a very complex question there. And I will, I'm going to push back a little bit because I don't think the responsibility lies with affinity groups. I see affinity groups and all of that as foundational. They're an enabler. They are the group that helps create the pipeline. But to get at the issue that you're talking about, that is a leadership yep. issue. Yep. Yep. Okay? Not an aff affinity group issue. And I've seen one model that works. Um, a previous Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral Mullen, mm. came when he was CNO, mm. he saw an issue. And he, and the way he acted upon it and his military ranks, which flowed over to his civilian ranks, is that he called in all of his community managers and said, okay, you're going to walk me through. You're going to report to me, the head guy, on your filling of positions and your pipeline. So they had to come in, and I was on the N1 at the time, so I saw this happen where he, each community manager, what are the jobs that make flag officers and general officers? We all know who they are. We know what those jobs are. We know the jobs that take GS-14s and make them 15. We know the jobs that make take 15s and make them SES. So what are those jobs or those positions? Okay, and to pack, you know, okay, when you get ready, so who are you considering for this? And make sure that that pipeline is diverse. Okay, so they can have an opportunity to compete. He didn't set a quota. He just says, I want to level the playing field. Mm -hmm. I want to make sure that everybody gets the opportunity. And that takes leadership. The affinity group can help with the pipeline, but someone has to hold the rest of the organizations accountable to follow through on it. And that was the best way I saw it. And as a result of this action, we call them the CNO morning meeting, CMM, it changed over a period of years. Okay, mm -hmm. you walked in there at one point, every flag officer around the table was a Caucasian male. A year later, had a couple of females. Two years later, you look at where you get two females, two African American. I mean, it was change. And it wasn't because he said, okay, I want two of these. It wasn't Noah's Ark, okay? <laughs> I want two of these. So, no, it was, all right. Let's make sure that everybody has an equal opportunity. Mm -hmm. Make sure that three jobs before you're sitting at the table, mm -hmm. you have people that have the experience that they need and have had the opportunities to show what they can do. And it's, to me, it's that easy but that complex. But it is clearly a leadership issue. I loved what um, Admiral Mullen said, too, was um, that people, civilians, would not wait him out. Yes. He wanted results. Yeah. And it was a big accountability. But you did see the tide turn um, with that kind of um, brute force, accountable, ownership, um, result-driven kind of leadership. You know, and I'll also say that, uh, you know, when we are diverse leaders and we get opportunity in leadership, we cannot be... Uh, I'll say it this way, we can't be afraid to ask, right? Um, You're reading my mind, Joe. I wanted to say that. I'm glad we channeled that. I thought it might be a little much, but I'm going to go there. No, it's the truth. It's the truth. So, I mean, yes, you are African-American. You are female. Now you're in this position, right? Um, you know, I, well, I'll just talk about myself. I think that I have to create access in my position because I would expect leaders in general to create access. And so I must pay attention and create access while I have this position. If I don't, I can't, I can't have that expectation for others. Um, and um, so I take that very seriously as a leader. And I often struggle, you know, because we put up so many thresholds. When, when we're faced with the situation that, that, that you pointed out, sir, we say, well, they're not there because we can't find them in this pool, or mm -hmm. they're not good enough in this area, and they're not enough of this. Um, I would struggle to say that everyone who got there was good at all of those things <laughs> all the way along, mm -hmm. but somehow 
think I did. And so um, in instances that I've been faced with very recently, I said, okay, well, let's go get some coaching for some folks. Mm -hmm. um, let's, do, let's do some things to start to build in places where we are saying that folks are inadequate. Um, and I have to do that in order to have the expectation that others would do that who are in leadership as well. I saw somebody back in the audience and it made me think about this and I hope they don't mind me sharing the story. Um, but it, it, it gets at the heart of this conversation and it also ties in the bias part. So there was a senior leader, female, <laughs> who uh, got into a position and started hiring for her organization and she hired other females. They were all very capable, mm -hmm. you know, but then people started to question. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, wait a minute, all of your people are female. Okay. Now this individual could have easily said, all right, I'm going to stop. But this individual spoke up, mm -hmm. you know, it's like, well, and this was a male making a comment. It's like, well, if you had hired all men, would anybody be questioned? Mm -hmm. And the answer was no. So why am I being questioned? Because the caliber of people that are meeting my requirements are women. Mm -hmm. So that's what it's about leadership. And we have to act. We cannot get um, guilted into saying you're just taking care of other women. I am pro-woman, but I also love men. Okay? <laughs> so it's not just because I love me doesn't mean I don't like you. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. right. So we just got to deal with that, and there's nothing wrong with that. It's how we look at it, though. But that that was a very powerful, um, yeah, message for me when I, I when she shared that with me. But I think it's typical. It happens probably more than we ever imagined. So, Larry, as I listen to the panel, and I, I'm just thinking of situations. Yeah, I just experienced that. Had that one. Had that one. Had that one. <laughs> um, it, it's hilarious. Um, but it's about leadership, and it's good that we have leaders here that are, that are doing that. I'm going to have one more question, and this is going to be a question out to the audience, okay? I owe you a book as well uh, for your for very, very good question that you had. But this is one it, it, for the general workforce, but it really talks about some of the more junior folks in the room, perhaps. And, it's, and you asked that question earlier, but how can junior employees and interns be good team members and contributors on a diverse team um, from your all's experience, especially when oftentimes the young folks coming in feel that, that their opinions aren't going to be valued. They feel like, well, I don't know as much, perhaps. So I would just open it up to the audience to just kind of reflect on what a, a more junior person can do to be heard and, and impactful on a team. Um, big part of that is don't be afraid initially, mm -hmm. because once you do start voicing yourself and start voicing what you have to say, I feel like just that initial thing, people will start listening to you and understanding what you have to say is important. So don't be scared. Don't be afraid. You, just, you just gave a good example of that. That's true. That's true. That's true. That's <laughs> true. May I tell a story, I, Eric? Yes, yes, please. So I just want to share. So I had a um, summer hire who worked for me named Dorothy. Um, amazing lady, um, doing great things now at NAFC. And I share her name because she's a rock star. But um, let me just share an incident. So we had developed um, something called a Navier Career Guidebook, and it laid out your technical um, expertise, kind of that career roadmap at all levels across all disciplines. So it was really powerful. Um, we had deployed it via our intranet, so you could access it in the office on your computer. And so we're all you know, sitting around, we're like high-fiving, we're celebrating, we're like, oh, this is good. And then out of nowhere, um, Dorothy says, you know, didn't you guys say there were some people that didn't have computers? <laughs> and I thought, <laughs> now, she had not met any of these individuals, but basically our artisan community, so we're talking about 9,000 people, did not have access to what we said was like, the, that was like the golden nugget, right? This is the career tool, you know, embrace it. Um, and immediately we go out, so we're like, oh, Man, took the, but so true, very bold, because we we're like, so, you know, all excited, but we did not think of that. She just recalled a conversation mm -hmm. where we had mentioned mm -hmm. that there were some people. So she said, so how, how would they get it? 
So we go running out to talk to a group of artisans and one bold guy in a base theater with about 1,500 people whom we never could find was very bold and said, you, ha you need a mobile app. And we're like, that's it. We're like, all this time, we need mobile. We went back to the hotel, we're sketching, no, we're not IT. Michael was IT, but we're not. And we're like, we're gonna, we have no money, but we're gonna figure this out. We're gonna go back. And I came back and half of my leaders were like, what? She goes out to California and now she wants a mobile app. Mm. But believe me um, that it was the voice of the one person that led to the next person that it allowed us to deliver the first ever mobile app mm. for Naval Air Systems Command. Mm. But it was that brilliant, bold person. And it was the other bold person in the room. So speaking up, um, volunteering, raising your hand, and challenging what leadership is saying is pretty profound when you're coming in. And we turn to you all, believe it or not, to do that. Like, what did we miss? <laughs> so embrace it. That is excellent. Yes, ma'am. So, oh, <laughs> um, so I'll kind of add on that. I'm a freshman in college. Um, I joined a research lab my freshman year. Um, I started off volunteering last semester, so I kind of had the same experience. I was kind of like, oh, like I'm volunteering, like my opinion doesn't matter. Um, and as time went on, I figured, because like everyone else was upperclassmen, and I kind of figured, you know, I deserve to say something too. I'm at this university for a reason, mm -hmm. and I think that's what it takes to know that you have your own personal knowledge that you can contribute. Um, that's personally how that's helped me kind of grow through that. Outstanding. Good, good. Okay. I just want to say for the younger people, um, it, I think it's very important to know your role that you have in the organization and also to know the culture, to learn the culture of the organization because you want to fit in. And at the same time, there's nothing wrong with mentorship. The power of mentorship is so strong. You know, getting a senior leader in the organization, someone who, who has a bird's eye view of the projects that are occurring, who knows what's going on, who's been with the organization for a long time, someone to hold your hand and guide you, I think that's very, very important. So mentorship, knowing your role, and um, learning the culture of the organization. Can I ask a question? Sure. You don't mean know your place. You just yeah. mean like know what you do. Know like be good at what you do. Okay, just want to make sure. All right. No, I mean because sometimes I've seen mm -hmm. organizations bring in young people and they put them in a box. It's like place. okay, this is what you do. Okay, and they have an idea about something, but that's not your role. I just wanted to make sure. Mm -hmm. Is that thank you. Back to the original question, um, I guess I've been with the government for nine years now. And so from my experience, coming from Louisiana, you know, the Deep South, it wasn't as diverse in dealing with all those racial issues. I kind of went into the job thinking, you know, I know what people perceive me as, so I'm going to go in and just be myself and try to show them who I am as an individual, mm -hmm. as well as exceeding in my job. So I think that my coworkers then started to, you know, at first it was a little, some comments made, but eventually they see me as a person mm -hmm. and not just as an African-American male. Because I was the first person, well, first African-American on my team. So it was a difficult, uh, it was challenging trying to work with everybody. And I can tell that there was already preconceived, uh, I guess, feelings or uh, things about me. but. At the end, I just didn't let any of that affect me because I knew who I was and I knew that I can prove through my expertise and as well as just being a good person that, you know, uh, you should look into being more diverse. And I've also, you know, tried to mentor other students. So now I'm a mentor and I try to mentor other students to bring them in to let them know that, hey, this is the environment that you're probably going to experience in all these companies. You have to learn how to navigate it. So. Sure. And, and so with that, I, guess, I think we're over, but I appreciate that Jarrell, uh, he's a fine Chemical Biological Center employee, <laughs> he's mentoring, doing great work, um, computer scientist by training. Um, so with that, um, thank you all. We were small but mighty here today. We had an outstanding dialogue and conversation, so thank you all. Thank you for listening to Harnessing the power of the collective, the importance of diverse teams to solve future defense challenges, a professional, 
Development Seminar, presented by the CCDC, featuring Director Dr. Eric Moore, Director C5 ISR Center Pat O'Neill, former Acting Assistant Secretary, Acquisition, Logistics, and Technology Stephanie Easter, National Industrial Business Operations Manager Adrian Somerville, and Director of the Vehicle Technology Directorate, Dr. Jared Riddick. If you have enjoyed this presentation, be sure to attend the Bay of STEM Global Competitiveness Conference. For more information on how you, your company, or organization can take part, visit www.bea.org. For college students, contact us at 410-244-7101.